it begins, the Lord speaks. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. He said, who is it that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Because you brace yourself like a man, I will question you. And you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me, if you understand. Who marked off his dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretches, who stretches the measuring line across him? Or what were its footing set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning star snags together, all the angels shouted for joy. And we go to page down to verses 34. Can you raise your voice to the clouds and cover yourself with a flood of water? Did you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do you report? Do they report to you? Here we are. Who endowed the heart with wisdom or give understanding to the mind? Who has the wisdom to count the clouds? Who can tip over the water jars of the heavens when the dust becomes hard and the clouds of the earth sticks together? Do you hunt the prey for lioness and satisfy the hunger, hunger of lions when they crouch in their dens or lay in wait in a thicket? Who provides food for the raven? When its young cry, out to God, and wonder about the lack of food. Thanks be to God, the word of the Lord. Well, the sermon today, it says in the bulletin, where were you? And that's what God asked Job. So the last couple of weeks, the at the beginning of October, the pastor just opened up the door to Job. She spoke a little the last few weeks. This week, we're going to take a look inside the house, see what Job, what he went through, suffer, and his faith in God that kept him going. And then God at the end rewards him with a whole lot. Everything he had lost, God replaced twofold, twice as much. See, I, I asked a few questions to some of our uh, members this morning. And I don't think, I don't believe that none of us, well, I'm too young, but served in World War II. Even when Bob was in Korean War, I spoke to Bill, and he says no. Did they stop with my husband yet? <laughs> well, <laughs> God bless him. <laughs> See, World War II, it was a in the old days, we looked at a lot of movies, and there was one person, Audie Murphy. I don't know if you remember, most of us probably saw the movie. This was not a fiction. This was his life story. He was a 
young man, he went overseas, and he took many lives beyond enemy lines. As such, he was one of the most decorated soldiers in World War II. You see, the name of the movie was The Hell and Back. That reminds us about Job. Job went to hell and back. In the introduction to the book Job, it says, the book of Job is named for its main character, a righteous man who is very rich, even after losing everything he owned and suffering from the terrible sickness. Job still confessed of his love for his God. Now that's for me, it's like going to hell and back. But the few words that covers when the past opened up the door <coughs> and we are now inside the house of Job to listen to Job what happened. See, the book of Job is often where people are told to go during such a time. Job is a man who suffered on unfathomable, great loss, big loss, a month of loss and grief in his life, and he deserved none of it. The book begins with these words. There was once a man in the land of Oz, whose name was Job. Now, if you look for Oz on the map, you will not find it. As far as anyone can tell, this land never existed. Which could mean that Job is a nobody from nowhere, or it could mean that Job is a somebody from everywhere. Job, like so many, is a man who suffered loss and grief in his life, though he deserved none of it. It's a story that is meant to help us ask the hard question of why. Why do we suffer so? If God is a loving God, if God is a powerful God, if God is an unknowing God, then why does such evil and heartache still exist in the world? Hard questions, tough questions. Many of you know the stories. Job had a perfect life, a perfect family, and most of all, a perfect faith. No one loved your God more than Job. But then along comes Satan, who whispers into God is? That Job only loves God because God has given him so much. Take all that away, Satan says, and the love for God will also disappear. See, God disagrees with Satan and accept his death. I have a little wager going on here. <clears throat> Very well then, everything, listen to what God said to Satan. Very well then, everything he has, it's in your hands. But, but, on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Job, Satan took everything away he had, his livestock, his family, everything that he had except his wife. I want you to hold this thought there because we'll be back to this. He loses everything. Chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, states, Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with all kinds of sores from the top of his head to the bottom of his soul. 
eventually, eventually, Job's health deteriorates as the boils and sores develop all over his body. Oh, in chapter one, I'm sorry, chapter two, we'll back up a little to verse eight. Then Job took some pottery and tried to scrape it off, thinking that it may go away. Never did. But listen for all the ladies who are present. I love the ladies there. Listen to what Job's wife said to him. That's in chapter 2, verses 9. His wife said to him, Are you still holding on to your integrity? This is more intriguing. Curse God and die. He replied, Job replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept the good from God and not the bad or the trouble? See, in all of this, Job did not sin in what he said. If you read the first two chapters, you will get one answer. Why do we suffer? Because God can do what God wants to do. Though innocence of wrongdoing and ignorant of the bet between God and Satan, Job has the stamina, the stamina to stay in faith. The Lord gives and the Lord gives away. Should we accept the good without also receiving the bad? Everything happens for a reason. If I were in the midst of tragedy and someone told me to read Job, I'd slap the Bible close right there in the middle of chapter 2. But if you can get past chapter 2 to see what happens next. Then I think the book of Job is still a good recommendation for those of us who are suffering. Job is a biblical celebrity, known for his patience in his suffering, but that's just the beginning, folks, which is just like us humans. We try to be strong at first, but the strength does not last. And neither does Job's patience. At the beginning of chapter 3, the volcano in Job's heart exploded with grief and anger. And listen to this. And, God, and, and Job curses his own birthday. Imagine, you know, on your birthday, you want to be happy. Not all the time, but Job curses his own birthday. The unedited version says, God damn the day I was born. This is Job, a man who loved God. Which is just like the raw, open source of the skin. But it is truthful. And any reader who has made it thus far breathes a sign of relief and nods their heads. Because this Job, they can relate to. Their world has been shattered and so has Job's. And now Job had finally released his death grip on being righteous and faithful. Job lets the world and God see what is really inside of him, anger and despair. You see, Job lived in a world that used to make sense, a world where you get what you deserve. That was all you needed to know. If you had a good life, if you were healthy and wealthy, then God has blessed you for your righteous godliness. But if you suffer loss and pain, then God has punished you for your sinful behavior. That was the way 
God and the world work in Job's mind. But that world doesn't exist anymore. Not for Job then. Because God, Job was innocent and Job was angry about it. He didn't deserve one ounce of what was handed to him. See, Job's friends, who knew nothing about the bet between God and Satan, tried to convince Job that he is wrong. Instead of defending their friends, they hold tight to their religious and defend God. Listen to what his friends told him. God is just, they say. Therefore, you must have done something to deserve this. The Almighty One, the one who hands out rewards and punishment, that one does not make mistakes. If you are in pain, then you must have brought this upon yourself. But Job is not helped by it. And neither are we. So Job, impatient, heartbroken, grief-stricken, God give God an airport chapter after chapter. Job howls and howls at God, speaking to God in ways that does not sound like a righteous man, and demands an answer to the question we all ask, why? God is silence and nowhere to be found. I go forward. This is Job. He's not there. Or backwards. I cannot deceive him. On the left, he hides and I cannot behold him. I turn to the right, but I cannot see him. Job chapter 23, one verse, verses 1 through 9. Now for 28 long chapters, Job complains to God, and God has nothing to say. 28 long chapters. It's very long, people. Which is perhaps the greatest loss of all for Job? The loss of his God. But then, but then, when Job cannot find God, God finds Job. And God finally speaks. You just heard it in the beginning of our scripture in chapter 38. I wonder if that is what like it was like for Job when God finally spoke. It was a relief just to have the silence broken and to hear from God. And not only that, but to hear so many questions from God, meaning God wanted Job to respond. Almost as if there was a conversation between them. A relationship between Job and God. When Job does respond, he makes a startling claim. Listen to what Job says. Before this, Lord, I had only heard about you, but now my eyes have seen you. Job 42, verses 5. Job has moved from a distance relationship with God, the one that is so close, Job can see him with his eyes. For four whole long chapters, Job gets to listen to the voice of God. And in the end, God was not angry at Job's anger towards God. In fact, God calls Job friends. He says, listen. God said to his friends, you have not spoken of me. What is right? As my servant has. Job 42, verses 8. According to God, Job's friends.
friends and their easy religious answers were wrong. And Job, with his howling and his protest, was right. Job's friend defends God and God defends Job. Which goes to show that God prefers Job outrage, Job outrage to God, Job's friends. Religious answers. Let that be a lesson for us all. In the end, God does not answer Job's questions of why we are suffering. Only God knows. But God does restore. Now it says, hold that thought, we'll come back to this. God does restore Job's family twofold, giving Job twice as much as he had lost. Which goes to show that it was not God whom Job lost. It was his understanding of God that he lost. Job lost the understanding of a just God who gives people what they deserve. More love, more forgiveness, more grace, more help, more strength, more prosperity, more than we can fathom. Job lost the God he believed in, but gave the God he needed. In the end, God's presence were more valuable to Job than God's justice. That might not be enough for us, but it was enough for Job. If we have ever lost God in the midst of suffering, the wisdom of Job teaches us that the ingredients for rekindling that relationship is both lots of howling and lots of time. Lots of time we may not realize. And then upon seeing God face to face, we learn we may have lost sight of God. But God never lose sight of us. Never. You see, Christ never lose sight of us because he's the King of kings and Lord of all lords. He is the almighty God that consider us his highest treasures. He will never leave us nor forsake us. He has engraved us in the palm of his hands. See, many of us know John 3, 16, verse 7. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in him shall never perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. Amen.